We are the brothers Mahoney, I am Michael, and I am James, and today we are discussing The Marian Conspiracy, which is the sixth release from Big Finish, featuring the sixth Dr. Colin Bege and a new companion Eveline Smythe, voiced by Margie Stables. It was written by Jacqueline Rayner, released March 2000, and runs for about an hour and 47 minutes or so. Of course, you can get it for cheap for less than four dollars off of Big Finish, and the plot is as follows: Tracking a nexus point in time, the Doctor meets Doctor Eveline Smythe, a history lecturer whose own history seems to be rapidly vanishing. The Doctor must travel back to Tador times to stabilize the nexus and save Evelyn's life. But there, he meets the Queen of England and uses all his skills of diplomacy to avoid ending up on the hard men's block. Now, the uh, questionable typo in that plot aside, uh, what are your thoughts on this one, Michael? I generally thought it was pretty decent. This is a pure historical story. So if you've seen some forced doctor stories, such as the Aztecs, the Massacre, the Romans, the gunfighters, the smugglers, sadly not the Elk, though. Yeah, unfortunately, the Elk, Despite the fact it could be a nice biblical story, just has monoids, which is certainly no bad thing, but... Yeah, I, I say it's a bad thing. These are stories that feature very little to no science fiction elements aside from, well, the time travel element of yeah, going the, 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 the past. The, 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 yeah, the starting promise of the fact that the Doctor is there in the first place. So this is a pure struggle. There used to be out of rage, in fact, when Doctor Who's touted it was partially to help teach history, which is why some of the oldest companions, Barbara and Ian, Barbara being a history teacher, Ian being a science teacher. So there, it was partially created to help teach history to children. So historical episodes were quite common back in the day. Charlton had one of the Highlanders, which of course was the first appearance of Jamie. But aside from Black Orchid, a fifth doctor's toy, just a two episodes toy, they haven't really been done in classic Who's Sans, and they've pretty much completely fallen out of fashion. But this is the, I guess, first attempt to try moving back to that. I think, despite not really knowing much about the history or the time this takes place in, I thought that John Lee came out okay, aside from a couple of story elements that seemed off. I mean, a lot of people find historical um, stories boring anyway. And I don't think this one's boring. There are just some quibbles I had with certain plot elements of it. They made me not like it as much as some other big finish ones we've discussed in the past. We'll get there. But I believe um, you've done some research into the history, have you not? I have, indeed. But before the history, let's talk about Eveline Smythe. Okay. Eveline Smythe is quite atypical compared to a lot of other companions that we might know. She is a 55-year-old history professor which is much unlike the young, attractive companions that you generally see if you've watched a lot of New Who. She's also quite hard, strong. Actually, not necessarily dissimilar to Donna from Season 4. Yeah, and also similar to Donna. She was a bit of an... Donna was as old as Evelyn, but you know, Donna was an, an older woman. What would you say? 30s? Maybe even 40s? I'm not sure we actually... Got an age at the top I, of I, I, can't, I can't really tell age, to be honest. She was. Yeah. But either way, she wasn't a 19 year old Rose who didn't even finish her A levels. I mean, I guess Martha would have been. I mean, Martha was a multiple student, but she would certainly have been a gold five years older than Rose. But either way, Avalyn and Dana are slightly outside of the normal trend of really young companion. And it's nice because Eveline is quite a bit different than what we might see you know, Sixth Doctor with Perry, for instance. The Sixth Doctor Perry relationship is one that some people have problems with. Some people have gone as far as to say it's abusive. I've always thought it's a pretty good companion doctor relationship. Once you get through the few rough patches at the beginning. Eveline Smythe is a lot more hard strong. She's able to hold her on against the Sixth Doctor. And very few people are able to do that. Of course, the Sixth Doctor is a very bombastic personality. But Eveline Smythe is actually able to hold her on against him, which is certainly nice to see. Yeah, much like the fifth Doctor, there's a scene that was very reminiscent of a scene from The Land of the Dead, which of course was the fifth Doctor Nyssa. At the beginning of that story, the fifth Doctor is telling Nyssa 
that history about Alaska, which he has no interest in hearing. But it gets reversed in this story because Everland is telling the doctor history about the Tudor era. Now, of course, you know, the doctor's been there before and Everland hasn't, but Everland's a history professor. So as you know, she's just luxury the doctor on uh, just, you know, things about the era. And the doctor's, you know, trying to get a word in, but he's completely unable to. She's just completely speaking over him. And it's pretty funny to see this happen to especially Colin Baker of all the doctors. Because it's not something he has to deal with often. And actually the whole setup of him running into Eveline and the whole setup for the story is so funny too. The story starts out with Eveline giving a laxo in her class. And there's just this uh, mysterious beeping noise that's going on. And, you know, she's trying to give the laxo, but eventually she, you know, snaps. But whoever is making that ridiculous noise, please stop now. And we hear the doctor, oh, I'm sorry, that's me. And then uh, he says that he can't stop, you know, the uh, machine. And, you know, she then tells the doctor, if that's the case, you leave the classroom. And he's like, oh, no, I can't do that either. And you can basically hear the glare she gives him. She just goes, hmm. And then she tries to continue on with the laxo. But, you know, the beeping's still going on. It's not working. So eventually, she just ends class early. And then the doctor just passes her. She thinks she's a madman, as, you know, most people do, especially if he's dressed like how he is. And, you know, it goes on from there. But, yeah, it's uh, maybe not his best first meeting with a companion, but, you know, it works at all. Especially when he was even in Tanya and her being a companion in the first place. It just kind of happened that way. And the whole reason he's there is because he's trying to locate what a, a time Noxus, I believe. Yeah, and that Noxus actually happens to be Eveline herself. Because whole history, as the plot says, literally uh, there's a scene where we're in her apartment and she's seen she has a, a family ancestry, a family tree. We literally, well, we don't see it, we hear it, but it's getting erased in front of their eyes, which is concerning for her. And she's also, you know, Having issues with this, you know, going in and out of existence, you know, that whole thing. It's, it's, not, it's not healthy. Which, of course, if it was televised, there'd be like a sort of fading in and out of existence that you see every now and again in time travel type media. Yeah, and, of course. Of course, I'm thinking to uh, Back to the Future near the um, end of the first movie. Yeah, so the Doctor and Eveline decide, well, Doctor doesn't really decide. Eveline decides to go with the Doctor. But they need to go back to 1558 or so to locate one of the ancestors. Oh, not so much locate the ancestors, but try to figure out what's going on with what's changing the past of Eveline Smythe's family tree. And something about John, something like I remember. Yes, basically, a wonderful ancestors, a John Whiteside Smith, who sees Sars was a... Um, a servant in the court of Queen Elizabeth and whose parents were involved in a plot to overthrow Queen Mary, the Queen Mary the Fourth, the Bloody Mary as, as he's known historically nowadays. And the doctor who of course well of course who has been involved in the Elizabethan court doesn't actually remember John Whitehouse Smith at all. So, you know, he, you know, makes that comment and, you know, they need to go figure out why her timeline is getting erased and, you know, what's going on with the, the, the John White House Smith issue, which gets into a nice lot of history that we, you know, were not familiar with. We might be ignorant Americans as, well, some Americans can sometimes be, but this story goes deep into, well, I guess not deep, maybe for English citizens and, you know, moms of the UK, maybe this is our common knowledge. But I haven't started English history. You know, in the USA, this country has only been around for under 300 years, whereas there's like a thousand years of English history. I, I, I haven't started the monarchy. I, I, it's not stuff I know. And I doubt it's stuff that we really taught that well in the public schools here. So they plan to go back to 1558 and are expecting a Queen Elizabeth IV to be on the throne. But they actually end up going back to 1555 in which Mary the first is on the throne. And despite the fact that both of them are women, and they're both queens, they are not quite the same. Mary is commonly known, at least by Protestants, as Bloody Mary. And she is one of the daughters of Henry VIII. And this is on the side of the history corner with Michael. <laughs> some episodes and some stories might need it, and this one definitely does. Because again, we did not know this history going in. 
But Mary the First is one of the daughters of Henry the Eighth. Henry the Eighth wanted to marry multiple women, which the Catholic Church was not particularly fond of. So he had the Church of England break away from the Catholic Church in an event called the English Reformation. Mary the First was a Catholic, so when she came into power, and she did that partially by executing one of the wives of Henry VIII, on a side note. Being a Catholic, she wanted to reunite the Catholic Church with the Church of England. And doing that, at least 280 Protestants were born at the stake in what is known as the Marian persecutions. So those Protestants who spoke out against the Catholic Church spoke out against the reunification of the Catholic Church and the Church of England. Well, they did not necessarily fare too well. So instead of landing a Protestant English reformed Elizabeth the First England, then started to land in a 1555 Mary the First of England's Catholic love land, which is not quite as lovely as you might think. I did appreciate though how this also threw in references. I mean, to me, pretty obscure references to, for instance, Wyatt's Rebellion, which was a rebellion in 1554, so the year previous which is just a, a very small rebellion against Mary the First's plans to marry Philip the Second, who was the Prince of Spain. And by marrying Philip the Second, that would sort of bring back Catholicism and papal authority to England, which of course, as Mary the First was a Catholic, she wanted, and as the Protestants who were being born at the stake did not want. So they have a reference to White's rebellion. Eveline mentions it, which again makes sense. Eveline is a history lecturer. She's a history professor. She knows this stuff. So despite the fact that this is history that I admittedly did not know, James didn't know, we didn't really know this going in. We, of course, researched it to figure out some context, but it's history we didn't know. And I can appreciate a story focused around this time period. So hey, at least it's educational for us. Yeah, and of course, the nice thing about it was that Evelyn, who in a, well, the best cliffhanger of this story, at the end of episode one, she's in a pub. She wanted to go visit the common people while the doctor goes cavorting with the queen, who, of course, at this point, he thinks is Queen Elizabeth. Well, Eveline just goes off to a pub, and she raises her class to Queen Elizabeth. You know, it's just a reasonable thing to do if she was three years in the future, but she is not, and she almost gets killed over it. Is of course, Queen Elizabeth is in house arrest right now, and... <laughs> Uh, she's not on the throne, and it's treason to say that she should be. If, you know, you, you're under monarchy, I, I could see that. So, yeah, um, she's la- very lucky that she happens to get saved by a couple of drinking bodies who just happen to be Protestants and not Catholics. Yeah, of course, Evelyn is a history professor, so she knows all about wild rebellion. Once she figures out, you know, what time she's in, you know, it doesn't take her very long to figure out, oh, okay, so this just happened, this is going to happen... And, like, she's able to work with it rather well, which a lot of other companions would have been able to, because, of course, a lot of other companions would have known the history like she does. Yeah, and as you can tell from this plot, from this sort of setup, whereas, like, the film Mango had a pretty heavy focus on politics, the focus of the Marian conspiracy is much more on religion, religious beliefs, and philosophy, and doing what's right. And, I guess, the idea of how you do what's right when it causes so much death. And this is really where the sixth doctor shines. He has a pretty stale, bad side manner here. He's a lot more gentle than what you might be used to if you've only seen the classic Who's Toys with Colin Baker, where he may not be quite as highly received. He, he's really gold here in his conversations with you know not only Queen Mary, who's voiced by Anna Rudin, but also with a uh, sort of a, a maid of the Queen's, a Lady Sarah, voiced by Joe Casterton. Yeah, uh, it's with a, it's in a conversation with Lady Sarah, which is actually good set up for Lady Sarah in the story also. But where the Sixth Doctor has an amazing quote, which I will give to you free of charge. Uh, I'm kind that way. So the Doctor's been consoling Queen Mary. You know, he's been debating, you know, because of course he opposes the burning of Protestants. He doesn't support that. I doubt, you know, he's not Catholic, he's not Protestant. And it's important to note that Queen Mary thinks she's doing what's right. I mean, yeah, she's born in people at the stake, but she's a, a true believer. She's a Catholic. She thinks she's born in heretics. And while it might be, well, killing these people, she is trying to save the souls 
of the citizens of England. So she's doing what she thinks is right, what she yeah. truly believes is right. And the doctor, doctor understands that she's doing what she thinks is right. But you know, it's not, it's not easy. Yeah, and it's funny because Eva Line, when she's talking to the Protestants she meets, they're not opposed to burning people at the stake. They just think they should be burning Catholics at the stake. So <laughs> it's not like there's any great sides here, alas. So the doctor is talking to Lady Sarah, Mary's handmaid, and just has this great quote. What would you say if I were to tell you that I once destroyed an entire race, that I have led France through the deaths and caused numerous wars, that my intervention has led to peaceful people taking up arms and gold people having their faith or reason destroyed? Because I fail to act, millions upon millions of people have been enslaved or killed. But if I had done all of those things, but had always, always believed I was doing the right thing. And that's just one, Baker was a great actor who was given poor scripts. But he was even, I think he's like, he's very good in audio form as well. And that's just very powerful because it's possibly this doctor who just innately believes he's right. Queen Mary has the excuse that she's religious. So if you're religious, you can justify any atrocity and the belief that it's what your God wants. And if you have God on your side, that makes it right. That's their prerogative. I mean, obviously, I'm not religious. So you're not going to hear me defend that type of thinking. But the doctor doesn't even have, you know, the excuse of having God on his side. He just has his own morals on his side. And so he has to, you know, struggle with these questions every day. So when he's watching Mary struggle, well, I guess he's struggling too hard with it. But when she, he's watching her explain her reasons for why she thinks it's okay to burn people at the stake, he, what he sees is, you know, he's questioning himself about how he is able to do what he thinks is right and the ramifications it has. It's, I think, a very, in fact, probably the most powerful scene in this story for me, at least. Yeah, and while the doctor is making connections with Queen Mary, and Lady Sarah, Eva Lyon, of course, is, as you might expect in a classic Who story, on the opposite side, who could have some Protestants who plan on overthrowing this queen. Now, the amusing thing is, Eva Lyon knows that this plan doesn't work, or it should it work, because Queen Mary doesn't die until 1558, so three more years. So there's not going to be any type of successful overthrow in 1555. But there is a plot of thought to do so. And eventually when Evelyn and the doctor meet up again, they need to find a way to figure out how to stop this assassination attempt of the queen. I mean, this queen's burning people at stake. But even so, they still can't let her die. Elsewise, Evelyn's whole history gets screwed up. And they don't even know why yet, on a, a side note. Yeah, it's, one of the, it's like a sad mystery throughout the story of who are the parents of John Whitehouse Smith. And, you know, it's not really focused on and There's not too many characters in the story, so it's not like there's too many absence. But, you know, it's there, and it's, you know, there's a couple of rad herrings. There's one that lasts for all about a second until it's revealed, oh, wait, that's not true. And no one, to be fair, should have thought it was going to be true. Yes, it would have been a, um, it would have been a very interesting uh, place for it to go. You know, but it still had, you know, a little mystery, and that part was okay enough. Yeah, I did like... The uh, character Lady Sarah, again voiced by Joe Castleton. She was a, a smaller part at the beginning. Hey, but she was going to marry the doctor, so <laughs> hey, that's something. Her conversation with the doctor is really good. And there's also some background information on her character that sort of comes up later. It's not really what I would call a twist, but it's a type of thing that you might see in Classic Who. It's a nice little surprise that at first I didn't see coming, but it's somewhat similar to things like what they may have done in or the fair mango whispers of terror. Just a, a nice little jump in this toy. I know I enjoyed it. Yeah, it was a nice fun. It wasn't, you know, we, we were both able to call it before it happened, but it was still a nice little treat for those who were paying a closer attention, perhaps. Despite the fact a lot of things, I think are decent in this toy. There's like a couple of small toy elements, maybe a bit nitpicky, but just a few things that sort of confused me. And one of them is that Eveline Smith meets up with some Protestants who are planning to overthrow Mary the First. One of them being a Reverend Thomas, who is a Protestant Reverend. Now, Reverend Thomas believes that Eveline Smith is a spy sent from, if not the Queen, the Queen's people. 
she's a Catholic spy trying to ferret out any potential rebellion against the queen. So he doesn't trust her. Then he gets the idea with another character to sort of set up Eveline Smythe as a, a patsy to make it look like she's going to assassinate the queen, which I, I'm not sure how he's expecting to pull that off. I, I, you know, he has a plan, of course. Eveline Smythe has some pills in her purse, and those pills in large quantities can kill someone. So, I mean, there's a quote-unquote weapon right there. I'm not sure where he thinks the motive comes from, though, because at this point, he's heard from well, another character that the doctor, who he knows is an associate of Eveline, is very close to Queen Mary, and he doesn't trust Eveline anyway, so he thinks largely that she's a Catholic spy, but he's talking to another character, like, oh, they're going to throw that traitor into the Tower of London, that traitor being Eveline, and I just don't know how that logic follows. If he thinks that she's a Catholic spy, one, I'm not sure how he thinks that the queen, who is Catholic, would ever think Eveline, who is an associate of the doctors, would ever try to kill her anyway. But even if she did, I, I just, this is a logical issue there that I just, I tried thinking through a couple of times and I just don't get it. Yeah, I don't, I don't get it either. There's a, a, there's a logical thought line that is missing because you can't... I mean, Michael Lowry and Thud, I'm not going to rehash the entire thing, but he thinks she was a spy sent by the Catholics or, or by Queen Mary herself. Then he wants to frame her as somebody who is going to poison Queen Mary, which is not reasonable if... It was somebody sent by Queen Mary, and presumably Queen Mary would know that, that she was working for Hall. So I just I don't understand how that's supposed to work. They they uh, introduced that idea at the end of episode two and into the beginning of episode three, and it doesn't really lead anywhere. You know, the doctor uses logic, not the logic we came up with, but uses a different logic. So hey, this is a poison; it's just an aspirin. So it doesn't work. But I don't know how it was supposed to work in the first place. I'm not really so the what the logic was, but I mean, I could not help but notice that. So that that is a bit of an issue. And that's not the only issue here either. No, at the beginning of the story, the entire idea of the story was that Evelyn had an ancestor who was part of Elizabeth's court. But the doctor did not remember who that guy was, you know. He, of course, had been around in Elizabeth in the time of Elizabeth's court, and he didn't re- recognize the name, he didn't recognize the man. Until the very end, when, you know, we figure out who the parents are and, you know, how everything went down, where he's like, oh, you know what? I guess he was there. I just didn't remember him. Now, I get it. The doctor's old. He doesn't have to remember everything everyone he ever meets. But there is a pretty cop-out answer to that mystery because it is a very compelling mystery at first. Like, ooh, the, you know, there's somebody who is an ancestor of this character who, the, who you know, the doctor doesn't know and he's been there. And yet, they just have it been that the doctor forgot about them, which isn't the most inspiring conclusion to that mystery. This was our first story written by Jacqueline Rayner, who I know also did a lot of books in the various Doctor Who ranges, from the uh, Voyage and New Advances and all of those books. So I'm sure she has a lot of good, you know, writing under her belt. But this was a bit weak. Not the story as a whole, although I guess the story as a whole is also, in my opinion, a bit weak. It's not bad, but it's it's not the best big finish thing we've listened to. But I mean, this plot reveal is partially was on the weaker side. And even besides that, there's the whole point that Evelyn is, you know, her history is disappearing. Her, she herself is disappearing because... There's a Nexus time thing going on with her, except unless it was historically always solved by the Sixth Doctor going back with her to solve the issue, then it's just one of those circular time th- time travel things. There's always a constant problem with time travel stories and fiction because we know that she did it you know, dying in a conspiracy in 1555 because we know she served until 1558, and yet I guess this is starting up that somehow the conspiracy, which I point out, is an alien in nature. It's just, it's not like it's aliens interfering in human history, which, you know, I could see that one. But no, it's just humans at the time somehow changing what is already a future fact. Uh, it's time travel. It's complicated to talk about. It's convoluted. And it's just one of those circular things that ju- doesn't really make sense from an outside perspective. 
I know this the whole time you wind the explanation, the uh, Tanth Doctor gives him blink, but it wasn't much in the way of an explanation, honestly. Yeah, the one thing I can say about that is that is why timelines are so important to uh, to remain sane. Well, yes, I suppose you could see it that way. Uh, of course, one of the things I like to do is just discuss uh, where these stories take place in a doctor's personal timeline. Uh, the TARDIS wiki has an excellent listing of every Doctor Who story and where they take place in each Doctor's individual timeline, which is a hall of a, you know, which is a hall of an accomplishment. And, you know, things get changed now and again. But even attempting this is um, honestly a bit absurd. So kudos to anybody who's, you know, tried to do this. Anyway, so of course, this story is a sixth Doctor story. It takes place in between, or the ultimate four, the last part of The Trial of a Time Lord. And, of course, Time and the Rani, the uh, first story with Sylvester McCoy. Now, the extended media, which may- is what makes this so fun, to explore all the bits of extended media that maybe we aren't as popular that people don't know as much about. I mean, we've been Doctor Who fans for years, and we're only now just getting into Big Finish. There's thousands of Big Finish material that's been released, so that's fun. Let alone all the multitude of books that cost $100 or more. But this takes place after... A story in the Jago and Lightfoot reigns. Jago and Lightfoot were these two side characters who appeared in the fourth Doctor story, The Talents of Wing Chiang, which of course also had Leela. It had a, a bit of a racism issue, but overall it was a very strong gothic story that I really actually enjoyed. I've only seen it once, granted. But I'll admit, even when I watched the story, these two characters, Jago and Lightfoot, they both stood out to me because they were just great in the story. They worked really well together, they were hilarious, and fans liked them so much that 40 years later they got a spin-off range from Big Finish because Big Finish will use anything as a spin-off. Really, they will use anything. They probably have to use too many things as spin at this point. But this uh, spin-off range has lasted for over 13 seasons and has almost 60 individual stories. So, I mean, that's a lot of material based on just two characters from a single story in Doctor Who. But th- so this takes place after the Jagon Light Force story, Voyage to the New Warlord, which came out in 2012, and of course has Jagon Light Force and the Sixth Doctor. And right after this is the Pacto of Leyen Maul, which is another uh, big Finnish story in the main range. It's actually number nine, so it's coming up pretty soon. You know, I believe it has the Sixth Doctor meeting the Brigadier. So that would be a lot of fun. I don't, we didn't get to see that in his original uh, time on TV. So that should be a fun reunion to witness. Yeah, so there are a bunch of big finish releases I'm looking forward to. So many sound interesting. There's so many interesting adapt to companion combinations. It's just a lot to look forward to. And we can look forward to it for a while because they're still, you know, releasing... It's seemingly hundreds of these a year, so... Yeah, I'm also looking forward to see what they do with Eveline. Because this story, much like a lot of classic Who stories, this story, despite focusing a little bit on Eveline's ancestors, did it really have Eveline as a, a focus point? I mean, sure, she had her own things going on with the uh, Protestants, but really, I think the standard of this episode was an Eveline, who I, th- I think did really well, Maggie's Tables. She's a voice actress who, again, is unfortunately deceased now. I think she did really well. But the standard of this story is really the sixth doctor's conversations with both Lady Sarah and Queen Mary the Force. The evil line is fun because when you first see her, you know, she's been, you know, doing a lux show. So you think that she might be some, like, McGonagall house teacher. Of course, McGonagall from the Harry Potter series. And you're just a house professor. But, you know, actually, she bakes cakes for students. She knits things for students. She has faculty parties where she drinks with the students. She's actually a very nice older woman who, you know, seems to love her students, spend time with them, helps them out. And it's a very nice companion to meet. And, uh, you know, it's going to be fun seeing future stories with her. And it is partially since she's one of the new companions created specifically for the big fitness reigns. Every form of media for Doctor Who liked introducing their own companions. Uh, there is, of course, the other famous penguin, Frobiso, introducing the comic books. And I know, at least in Big Finish, I can't think of any other companions for any Doctor besides the Eighth. But I know we get Charlie, and I know there's one called... I think Lucy. Yes, Lucy. Lucy Miller, that's who it is. 
And I know that even the bulk ranges, like even the uh, missing advancers range in the 90s in the Duce Compartment for the Sixth Doctor, who only appeared in two stories and then never appeared again. So that's fun. Yeah, so it's always nice that they're pitting their own Mark and the Companion for, you know, the Sixth Doctor. And one, I look forward to indie companions that get introduced, you know, for other Doctors. I actually think there's an, you know, there's one for the Fifth Doctor that w- that we get to enjoy. I don't remember what their name is, but I believe they show up in the Isle of the Scorpion. But they're around. But yeah, it's going to be nice seeing the um, other Companions, and it's going to be nice seeing more of Evil, and especially since he's a very interesting idea for a Companion. You know, just a nice older woman who happens to be a, a history expert. And I think the sixth doctor will also like her since she can also bake cakes for him. Yes, at the end of the episode, he wasn't very convinced about taking her on as a companion. But she, you know, said, oh, well, you saved my life, so I suppose I sort of bake you a cake. And then this doctor, he's always enjoyed the more earthly pleasures. He is a bit more robust. And so he's like, you know what? Maybe you, perhaps you can stay on as a companion. And, you know, she, she says a nice older woman, she keeps Coco in her purse. And so I think she says going to be a um, hoot to enjoy in future stories. Now, it does mean there's going to be last stories, likely with the sixth Doctor and Perry. But on the other hand, that means you're going to get more stories with the uh, fifth Doctor and Perry, which is a, you know, which is a Doctor companion relationship that we only see in one story. So it's going to be nice to see that expanded down as well. I have to imagine a sixth doctor is going to enjoy cake more than carrot juice. Yes, I believe that's almost certainly the case. But yeah, overall, I think the Marion conspiracy, it's decent for a nice historical story. Like James said earlier, some people will find historical stories a bit dull at times, but I think this one came out decent. A few story elements, I did it quite good. But that's sad if you've listened to this and uh, maybe you have some solutions to the questions we had. I'm definitely interested in letting us know. I mean, it's easy to talk to people who have seen classic, who have seen the Reviver series, but there's not quite as many people who listen to the big finish releases. So I'm definitely interested if anybody out there has listened to this one, what they thought about it, they agree, disagree. Just always nice to reach out. Yeah, for me, the story was certainly not one of the uh, stronger efforts. I mean, all the voice acting, everything was fine. Like I said, that line from the sixth doctor was great. A lot of the characterization was very strong. It's just the plot itself was, I would say, it's on the weaker side. And that's not to say it's a bad story, but I just didn't love as much as a lot of the other big finish things we've listened to. You know, granted, there hasn't been all that many right now, but I just don't think it's really going to be all that memorable in, for the foreseeable future, except, you know, a couple of lines here or there and that Eva Lyons fan introduction. But overall, it's not that bad. It's just not memorable. Well, hopefully we can change things around with what we have coming up next. And what would that be, James? I mean, up next, we have a fourth Doctor story. It's one of the perhaps more unassuming ones, but the Mask of Mandragora which, of course, has the fourth Doctor and Sarah Jane. So that's going to be a uh, fun discussion. Yeah, and we've seen most classic Who at least once, and this is one story that we've only seen once. So it would be nice to revisit it. I I honestly don't remember that much about it. So it would be nice to revisit it uh, with fresh eyes and see what Tom Baker gets up to in these shenanigans this time. Yeah, Tom Baker is always good fun, so it'll be nice to um, see him again. But yeah, so yeah, that has been the main conspiracy. Let us know what you thought about well, this story or any story. We're not picky. Uh, I am Michael. And I am James. And you can follow us at Brothers Mahoney on Twitter if you so desire. We post about what well, exactly who things pop into our mind. And we're jolly good people. What well, we try to be. But hey, we hope you have a good day. Thanks for listening, and as they said, peace out.